Okay, I'm going to ask some specific questions. Um, so I'm going to ask a bunch of them, so you could try to just give three-minute answers, and we'll try to run through a lot of points that I want people to hear. So how will climate change affect the world's food supply, and when will this start happening? Anyone who, want, anyone who wants to answer that? Um, well, the, 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 the graphs of productivity of the various of the major constituents like maize and rice show that um, we can, in the case of rice, we can have about one degree more warming and then the yield goes down. Um, so once we, once we warm beyond another one degree, yields will go down and yields are going, will, will start going down on all the major um, food sources at a time when the population is going up. And one of the frightening things, which I, statistic I, I dug out, but it's in a UN report and it seems unbelievable, but um, it's uh, predictions of, of population by the end of this century. And the, they do it by region. And this, this is an official UN report. And the, the predictions from most parts of the world are something like a 30% increase. That, now, that's, that's pretty serious anyway, because we've got to find 30% more food. But Europe, the population will actually go down a bit. But Africa is going to quadruple. And um, this is going from sort of 1 billion or so to 4 billion. And um, Africa's already a continent which can't feed itself, and it's very dependent on food aid. Um, for instance, American food aid, which has dried up because the, the, the maize that, the, that was used to, to send to Africa in the case of famine is now being turned into biofuel to power SUVs. Um, so you've got a, a massively accelerating population, at least according to the UN predictions, for in, in parts of the world which are least able to feed themselves. And then you've got a decrease in yields of all the fundamental foods. So uh, the collision between those two is, is, is already starting to happen. And um, it, will, it will become more serious as the temperature gets beyond the one degree warmer than it is now, because that's when yields will start to go down. Um, I, I think that it's self-evident that, uh, in fact, we're not going to feed the, this new cohort of people who are theoretically coming along. Of course, um, it, it's true that people uh, have sex under conditions of hardship, and the, and that so that they they will probably reproduce. You know, there's kind of an overhang for the population growth as as we encounter these problems with. Um, feeding the world and all of the other environmental problems and economic problems that grow out of this series of dilemmas, uh, you know, it's going to create a lot of hardship in the world and already is. Um, and I agree with what you said about the, um, you know, the Syrian refugee problem is probably a, a large part of it has to do with the fact that they've, they've been having uh, water problems in Syria and, and uh, they can't feed themselves. Uh, at the same time that uh, their revenue from oil went way down over the last decade. Uh, they didn't have much of it to begin with, but now they have none to, to uh, export. Um, but I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not convinced that uh, uh, sooner or later th this problem is going to uh, resolve itself by there being less people, fewer people. And we're probably not going to find a way to feed this hypothetical new cohort of of newcomers, uh, where it's not just climate change. You know, we are going to face problems with the fossil fuel herbicides and fertilizers and pesticides that were are enabling the uh, uh, the extra food to have been created. You know, there's a lot of uh, jabber about the green revolution that began in the 1960s and 70s, but it had much more to do with just our ability to pour fossil fuel soil amendments on the, on the ground than it did with coming up with new strains of grain that produced 
you know, m higher yields. And um, we're going to run out of, uh, uh, or we're going to have trouble with all of those fossil fuel products. So there will be fewer people, and, and um, I it's only one of the disorders that, uh, w that we face that we're going to have some choices about. But one of the things that we can do is, uh, I mean, we, we, it, w it would be possible to have a conscious policy in our country for dismantling industrial agriculture and rebuilding smaller scale agriculture uh, where smaller farms were better cared for by more people with, with the less intervention of machines and less, you know, more bi biodynamic practice. Uh, but clearly we don't want to do it. You know, we, we, we can't be dragged kicking and screaming to do things that are going to eventually be better for us, and, and so, uh, uh, you know, we're kind of stuck with the consequences of doing nothing. How is climate change a national security issue to the United States? I, just, I don't know if I can mention a, an example uh, that uh, in the year 2000, when uh, nobody was accepting that the Arctic ice was disappearing um, except the Department of Defense um, because they, the, they made the, the one climate modeler who was predicting a uh, very rapid decline in the sea ice who was using a very, very powerful computer in Monterey um, was the one who had the ear of the Department of Defense. So in the, the year 2000, they had um, a big symposium called um, uh, studying the consequences of a, the, the, the military consequences or defense consequences of an ice-free Arctic. So this, this word ice-free Arctic in the year 2000 really was amazing to, to stand most sort of standard scientists. You know, what's, what's this ice-free Arctic they're talking about? But that was because the Department of Defense was ahead of everybody else in seeing what was happening in the world, that, that they certainly were aware of this decline of the sea ice. And so they wanted to, to uh, be able to control the Arctic, this ice-free Arctic. So they, they realized it was a challenge because you had to go there and occupy to control it and patrol it. Uh, so they needed to know that the ice was going to disappear because that creates more ocean for, for the Navy to have to control. Um, so, in a sense, the, the Department of Defense had to be realistic about climate change in a way that other branches of the government didn't have to. They could get away with this kind of fantasies that it wasn't really very serious and so on. But, but the Department of Defense, of all people, ha uh, turned out to be the one department that actually realistically understood and accepted the rate of climate change because it impinged on on defense needs. So um, it, it's a kind of strange, uh, sort of strange counterintuitive thought that, that, that they're, they're the most realistic department in the United States government. The U.S. Navy has lots of facilities in Norfolk, Virginia. And Norfolk, Virginia is kind of like Miami in terms of being underwater even when it's not raining sometimes. And the Navy is quite aware that their facilities are in peril and it's going to cost them a lot of money to pick up and move inland, but they're going to eventually have to do that. How has uh, global warming, climate change affected uh, uh, geopolitical turmoil? Is, th is that the question? Uh how is climate change a national security issue to a the United States? Issue. But you can well, an answer it how you like. It's obvious that uh, uh, the conditions in the world today are generating a lot of ill feeling. And much of that ill feeling is coming from people who f feel that they are not getting the resources that they deserve. And we are having a scramble for resources around the world, especially food and water and energy. And those three things are going to become uh, even more, uh, pose more difficult challenges as the years go, go by. There's going to be a, a fourth one that will, that will join 
those in the scarcity uh, uh, arena, and that's uh, capital, because we, we've been uh, functioning with a, a, a lot of capital that actually isn't really there. It's, it's uh, imaginary, hallucinated wealth, and that's going to vanish too. You know, you look at the Middle East and you see a region of the world that is one of the most inhospitable places for human settlement, and yet you've had some of the greatest population surges in Saudi Arabia and the Emirates and uh, many of the other uh, Middle East and North African countries and, and uh, uh, Western A Asian nations. The greatest population growth in that part of the world. And, you know, it, it's almost entirely due to the oil wealth that they generated uh, over the last 60, 80 years. And when their ability to generate that wealth goes away, a place like Saudi Arabia is going to become a v a very, very difficult to get by. You know, I think that that's one of the things that's driving the beginnings of disorder in the Saudi kingdom and in, in, in the royal uh, hierarchy in Saudi Arabia now, which is obviously undergoing a, a pretty severe change with uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salman. And um, uh, so the prospects for places like that are pretty, pretty grim. And uh, they've already uh, generated tremendous amounts of refugees. They will probably generate more as the situation becomes more severe. And uh, I have no idea how we're going to sort that out. Uh, although I think that we're going to see rather harsh policies. We, I think we're going to see countries make a conscious decision that, you know what, we cannot take in every uh, poor person, every poor suffering person in the world who wants to get out of some terrible part of the world. We just can't do it. And it's going to be kind of a human lifeboat situation. So um, it'll be tough. How much have wildfires increased in the last 50 years, and is this because of climate change? Well, I don't, I don't know the numbers, but I, I did spend the last six months in Southern California, so uh, <laughs> was <laughs> was surrounded by them. And uh, what what the local people say is that one of the things that's made them worse is the fact that uh, the people building houses out in in remote spots because people like to live in remote spots and. Um, these are in areas which naturally would burn through from time to time because of the the the, the brush catching fire and being it's a w it's a w nature's way of of sort of cleansing the uh, the area. But because people are building high priced houses there, the fire the, the firefighters would always do their best to 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 stop stop any fires that broke out and the result is things will build up to a, a, a very large um, a, a very large head of, of um, and then it will burst out in something uncontrollable so it's it's man it's it man has had something to doing with it because of his tendency to try and settle everywhere uh, with um, building his houses in 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 the middle of the, of the countryside Let me just say that I've been uh, around uh, out west and I've seen some interesting manifestations of this. The, uh, because uh, the, uh, because the, the we've had some weather changes, climate changes in the west that have allowed additional generations of particular beetles um, produce another generation during one season. Um, they've created a tremendous problem with uh, the pine bark beetle in particular. So when you go out to Colorado, New Mexico, and actually uh, clear up into British Columbia in the Kelowna region of the, the Antonagan region of British Columbia, and even up into Alaska, you know, you see tremendous damage to the pine trees. You see all these r rusty colored red pine trees on the hillsides in the Rocky Mountains. And these are all pine trees that are dying because beetles are having another generation uh, to reproduce during one particular summer. 
So, and, you know, th this is only one of the manifestations of this, but I'm sure that there are, you know, thousands, tens of thousands, or maybe millions of effects like this that we, we don't, we don't, we're not aware of, we don't measure, we, we don't notice. Thank <laughs> you.